Right, so this morning we start a new three-week series because after that we, we begin to move into more of a traditional season, um, which if you allow me, I'm going to change <laughs> in about three weeks' time by some teachings that I, I believe the church needs to hear. Um, it's going to be very different. It's going to probably challenge you a little bit, um, but it's definitely going to break some of the norms that we have come to understand within scripture, within the church, um, and it's, it's going to hopefully move you to a, a different level of faith and a different level of belief. Uh, and the reason I say that is because if your faith isn't growing, then it's dying. There's no such thing as a stagnant faith. It either grows or it dies. It's one of the two. And unfortunately for you, for me, the, 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 the growth or the death of your faith is wholly and solely in your own hands. And that's what you have to begin to look at. And that's what we hopefully are going to begin to look at this week as we, we have a look. One of my greatest passions in Origins Community Church is that we would become a church that actually reads the Word of God. Okay, now understand that we are a Bible-believing church. You guys all know this. For the, for the visitors, uh, this is who we stand. This is the precept upon which we work. We are a Bible-believing church with the emphasis on the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that connects to the rest of Scripture. So if you don't know who we are and what we do, you'll come to realize that whatever we preach comes out of Scripture. Whatever we teach comes from Jesus Christ. I won't teach John Maxwell. I won't teach uh, Louis Giglio. I will teach Jesus. Uh, I may use their material to help me, guide me through that, because they all have huge insight. They have massive insight into who Jesus is and who God is. But ultimately, it will boil back to the scriptures as we understand it, the Bible as we understand it. Back in 1995, I got involved with an organization called the Walk to Emmaus. Lovely organization, fantastic. Had, it, it just wasn't for them. I don't think I'd be in the ministry today. Um, but they had a youth arm called Chrysalis. So we spent a large chunk of time ministering within this youth arm. Um, I made a lot of good friends who are still friends today. A lot of them aren't youth anymore, but, you know, that's what happens in time. And the ministry was basically based on the fact that you would go away for a weekend and you would just be spoiled rotten with the love of God. People would come and do the weirdest things for you. They would just love you. And people's lives changed. My life changed because of this, this love. Now, and, I, and I still sort of sometimes, because it's a lot of hard work, but I still sometimes I sort of miss the work. And Renee knows what I'm talking about. And there's a couple of us here who've been, Bev was involved in it from, for a long time. It was a large part of our lives. But there was one thing in Emmaus and Chrysalis that you didn't do. This is the one cardinal rule that you never broke. And that was that you allowed the time to run away with you on these weekends. The reason was the time was key critical because the weekend was planned out in something called a minute-to-minute -minute schedule. And I kid you not, minute-to-minute -minute this thing was worked out. And when it worked, it worked well. When it didn't work, it didn't work well. Simple as that. All right. Spend enough time in Emmaus and in Chrysalis, and you came across the dreaded timekeeper. Now, this was the person who was in charge of keeping this weekend on track. Um, and, and they used to do this by ringing a bell. So the bell was probably the most hated thing on the weekend because you were just falling asleep on your bed and the bell would ring and you had to get up and go off to some hot 42 degree conference room and sit there in the middle of summer and, and, and try and focus on, on, on some dude that waffles about Jesus and, you know, you fall asleep. So the bell wasn't the most favorite person. So often in, in, in Christmas and Emmaus, we, we, it, it became sort of a tradition to try and steal the bell. Because you could steal the bell, then the bell couldn't ring. So you could do what you wanted, you know? And it became so bad, eventually they banned it because every time the bell just stood alone, it was gone, you know? And um, often in Christmas, the, 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 the bell used to end up in the bottom of the pool, which would be fine if the Christmas weekend was in summer, but it wasn't. It was in Potch in July. So the water was like minus 72 degrees Celsius, and some little oak had to go down there and go fetch the bell. Usually the youngest and the smallest of the lot of us, you see, so... And that was the fun part. We, I remember one year we had the, what we used to call the Twisted Sisters, the Bluets. They were twins, but they had a warped sense of humor. The bell disappears. We don't know where it is. It's gone. Yes, and about a couple of hours later, we find this bell. It's hanging from a noose, execution style, covered in all gold tomato sauce above the timekeeper's bed. So it was a subtle warning to him to be very afraid. Don't close your eyes. We're coming for you. Needless to say, we had a lot of fun on these, and the kids loved it. The youth absolutely loved it. We, we saw some, I mean, I know of youngsters who came in at 14, 15, who today run mega churches, 2,000 members, guys, just, you know, from, from the work of that 
not only really that, but how they became effective for God's kingdom through stuff like this. Now, this whole idea of the bell, of course, was really a, 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 a way to control us to do what needed to be done. Now, have you heard of Pavlov's dog? Russian scientists who realized that through conditioning you can get people and animals to do what you want. And he had a bell, and every time he used to ring the bell, his little dog used to come and sit and wait for its food. And he realized, well, if this works for animals, maybe it works for people too. Now, if like me, you've tried it on your wife, well, then you probably had to put in a claim with medical aid because she put the bell in a very uncomfortable place. <laughs> Down your throat. Where's your heads, people? Down your throat, okay? It didn't work so well with her. Okay, that's all I can say. But here's the thing, <laughs> most of us here this morning, we have a bell. We all have a bell. And I tell you, <laughs> that's the bell. <laughs> Let's go, tea time. <laughs> we have a bell. That couldn't have happened at a better time. <laughs> and no matter what you are doing, no matter where you are, no matter how busy you are, no matter where you find yourself, that's the alarm company. They can just ring, it's fine. No matter where you are, that's the alarm company. Obviously, somebody must let the alarm go off, I think. Um, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you could be driving heavy power machinery, you could, be, uh, you could be in a meeting, you could be with your family, you could be, if that bell rings, you will stop what you're doing and you will respond to it. You will respond to it. In fact, you'll be in a meeting and, 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 and the bell will go off and you will favor the person who you know that you're talking to, or you, you'll favor the unknown person on the bell over the person that you're talking to. And I know how you guys work. The bell goes off, you sort of, let me just switch this off, and you'll read it. I know, this is how we do things. You know what that bell is? It sounds a little bit like this. Sounds a little bit like that. Okay, the, the, the tone changes. I can't switch it off here. Yeah. The tone changes. We've all got different tones, but that's what your bell sounds like. You could be traveling at 200 k's an hour in a car. And if that sound goes off, you will pick up your phone at 200 k's an hour and see who's texting you. Well, not all of us, but some of us, okay? Um, and you've got mad skills if you begin to answer them back at 200 k's an hour, okay? Now, it's been proven. At 200 k's an hour, your car will go straight along the road, up until the point it hits the pole, in which case, you know, the real thing will happen. You know it's so bad in South Africa? I don't know about the other insurance companies, but our insurance sent me a letter saying that if they can prove that I had an accident while texting, they won't pay me out. That's how bad it's become. And we know that. You've seen this. I mean, even myself drive, and you can see the oak in front of you. He's like this, and this is 9 o'clock in the morning. So, A, he's not drinking, so he must be doing something else. He's either got the phone here, and he's, he's trying to check the map book and have a cup of coffee while reading the newspaper, or he's sitting with us like this. It's misspelled, you know. You know and then <laughs> I've seen it happen. We've all seen it happen. I don't know about you, but do you remember years ago when you were still kids, when you sit around the dinner table at night with your parents and the phone used to ring, what did your parents used to say? No. Oh, you bad parents. Uh, <laughs> no, your parents used to say, if you grew up in a Christian home, your parents used to say, let it ring, they will phone back. Okay. That was wonderful. A generation later, same dinner table, same family, the phone would ring, what would the parents say? Let it ring, the machine will get it. Today, when we sit around the table and you go to any restaurant, you see this. Every person has got their phone with them. Some people have got their tab and their phone with them. And that's what they're talking about. Einstein had it right. Where's my little machine key? He had it right. The day Einstein, Albert Einstein feared has arrived. And this is what he said. I fear, this is in the 50s, eh? I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Is he far wrong? I think he's spot on right. Because how often do we see people in coffee shops, intimate dates on their phones? How often do you see them on the beach? They're not looking at the beach, they're not enjoying it, they're on their phones. Cheering your team at a sports match. Guys are texting the whole time. Intimate date. I love this, I've seen this so often. In fact, David had to tell me to stop doing it. 
<laughs> Driving, enjoying the sights, they're on their phones. Having dinner with friends, they're on their phones. This thing has become a distraction. It's become a massive distraction. And it's understandable why we respond to this little sound that we have. It's understandable. But you know why? Because we know three things about text messaging. You know the person who is, in most cases, sending you the text. That's the first thing. Secondly, the text message is usually about something relevant to your life at that specific point. And thirdly, and this is the biggest bonus, you don't have to respond to it immediately. You can read it, but you don't have to talk to that person immediately. So we know three things about text messaging. Text messaging has really, or texting, has become a massive distraction. Psychologists will tell you that kids today are in a far worse off place than kids 10, 15, 20 years ago because they're not talking to each other anymore. Your best buddy, if you say 10 words a week to him, in a, a, a words a week to him in person, it's a lot. Otherwise, it's that's all you do. We know that. We've seen that. And the thing is, I mean, who still answers voicemails? Okay, Jared, you knew, so it's fine, I'll let you live. Um, who answers voicemails? Do you know that most people don't answer their voicemails anymore? Why? Because it's so last decade. It costs money, I like that idea, yeah. It costs money, but besides that, oh, voicemails are so last decade, nobody answers them anymore. And you know what happens with your voicemails? If you're like me, the, the, the ones come in, I'm busy, I don't always see it, so then eventually I realize, but wait, I've got three voicemails. Okay. So now I pick up the phone and I dial in and I go, and I hear so and so from so. Okay, it's, uh, I've done that, checked, checked. I don't finish the messages. And that's what we do. We take our voicemails and we categorize them in, in, in importance. Is it important right now? No, delete it without reading it or listening to it. Is it relevant? No, delete it without listening to it. Most people do that with their voice messages. But when it comes to text messaging, everybody reads their text messages. You may scan it, but you will read it. You know that when we. Um, the text message, when you, when you meet somebody, you've sent a message, and you never ask him, listen, did you read my text message? We don't ask them that. We always say to them, did you get my text message? Because we know if you got my message, you read it. 99% of all text messages will be read by people. Or scanned at least to know what the content is. You do not look at it and delete it without reading it. It's who we are. That's how we've been, we, we, we've been functioned to do this. But let me tell you something this morning. All of us received one text message in our life. The most important text message that either you paid attention to it or you didn't. Had you not paid attention to it, had you not placed the correct importance on this text message that you received, then I'm going to say to you, or had you do, done it, sorry, had you done it, had you placed this text message in the, in the correct context in your life, at the right place of importance, then your life would probably look a little bit different today. Your marriages would look very different. Your finances would have looked very different. Had you read this message as, as a teen, then your morality would have looked very, very different. Renee, had you read the text message a lot earlier, where are you in life? then you wouldn't have pitched up with some of those tonsils you dated. Okay. All right. I just thought I needed to say that. I've been many years, I've been, I had to get this off my chest. But she married the right tonsil, so it's fine. <laughs> the reality is, the reality is, God sent you a text message. He sent you His Word, the Bible. And for many of you right now, you know where that text message is sitting? In your unread folder. You haven't opened it. You haven't looked at it. And the thing is, with God's message, you've got to understand this text, there is no expiry date. It is relevant. It is important. It's going to change the way you look at things, but it's still lying in your unread folder. And I'm going to say something to you that many of you pick up this message and you look at it and you go, oh, it's a bit old fashioned. It doesn't really apply to my life today. And here's the thing if that is you today, if you believe that it's old, then as we're going to see a little, little later, it is anything but old. The message that God sent you was personal. You know how I know that? Because the God who flung stars... I love that line. Sorry, it's just one of my favorite uh, scriptures. Uh, the God who flung stars into space and who placed every planet where it should be and named all the stars and hasn't lost one of them took time out of his schedule to send you a personal message. It is personal. 
You know how I know that it's relevant to your life today? Because that same God sent you a message which 2,000 years ago was relevant. But if you look at it today, it is still just as relevant in your life right now. The flip side, of course, is that did you grow up in a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian family, in a church environment? Well, then you're going to say to me today, you know, because of this text message, my life is fuller. My life is, is richer. My life was better off. My marriage is better. My finances look good. My life and my relationships are wonderful. Why? Well, because God sent me this message and I read it very early on in my life. And He changed the way I do things. He changed the way I function. He changed the way. And you know why? It's because I understood who the author was. I knew why He did it. I understood why He sent it to me. I grew up in a, in a Christian family. Um, and, 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 I, but I, and I knew who God was. I knew who Jesus was. My mother forced me to go to Sunday school, which is an awesome thing, not back then, but right now. Um, she forced me to go to Sunday school. It was, that's why I am here today. But I knew who Jesus was. I knew who God was, but I wasn't interested. Until I was about 28 or 29 years old, I was not interested in the Lord Jesus Christ. He couldn't offer me nothing. In fact, when I got confirmed at age 16, Horizon View Methodist Church. I walked out that Sunday night and I turned around and I said, Jesus, you have nothing to offer me. And I walked away. For 12 years, I partied like a rock star. But that's besides the point. Until I made the amazing mistake of going on a walk to Emmaus. And Jesus changed everything for me. In a space of 72 hours, he changed my life. I don't often talk about it, and I haven't spoken about it for many years, but had Jesus not met me in 1995, October the 15th, I would probably be dead today. I would be a full-blown alcoholic, probably. And Jesus came in. He stopped me smoking. Well, he did that, but uh, he helped, all right? Uh, and he stopped me drinking overnight. Boom, I just stopped drinking. So... What I'm saying is that is the power that Jesus has through his message. And that was the point where I began to, to read and go through scriptures and begin to, to touch on the word. Now, if you've been with us, as I said just now, for a, for, for a period in, in, in Origins, then you know what I feel, how I feel about us reading the Bible. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do everything in my power to have you, get you to begin to open that book that you own at least one of. I know you do. You know you do. Okay? And it's going to boil down to simply this. You are going to have to want to open that book. This is not going to open itself. You are going to have to want to open it. And you are going to have to do the most unthinkable thing with it. You're going to have to begin to read it. Now, I'll tell you why this is important. And I know some of you are saying, but you know what, I don't, I'm not really a reader. I'm not really someone who reads. Sorry, if I sent you a text message right now, in the middle of my sermon, you will stop and you will read it. I know you will. Because I would do it too. No, um, I know you will, because that's how we are wired. You are a reader, whether you like to admit it or not. And I know how, what, what, what you're saying. There's a tendency for all of us to be lazy because you know, and I know, that if I come to church on a Sunday morning, well, you know what? Andre's going to read the scriptures to me. I'm going to spoon feed you guys the word. Or even better, you know what Andre's really going to do? He's going to put it up there so I don't have to bring my Bible to church. I don't have to carry it with me. We are human. We are lazy. I know. I are one. We are. So for the next few weeks, I'm going to teach you, and I hopefully you are willing to learn, how to actually read your text message that God gave you. In fact, at the end of three weeks, I'm going to give you some reading plans. I just started one now. It's, it's a lot of reading. It's two chapters, three chapters of the New Testament. Actually, just a New Testament plan I'm doing. But it's three. No, no sorry. It is, it is Old Testament and Proverbs too. At the end of the year, I will have gone through the New Testament and a large part of the Old Testament. Now, you work that out. 66 books. I don't even know how many chapters there are. Divide that by 365. It clocks out to something like six or seven chapters a day. 365 days. Now, I get it. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of reading. But God died. Uh, Jesus died to make sure we got this message. 
if you can't do six or seven chapters a day, then there's something wrong. And there is something wrong in the church because people aren't reading their Bibles anymore. There is something. Let me put it to you simply. Do you know where a lot of my peace came from as a Christian, as a man? Where a lot of my wisdom, and I'm, I'm not the cleverest person, let's be real about that, but a lot of my biblical wisdom came from? It didn't come from me picking up Maxwell or Stanley or Giglia, books like that, or watching DVD. It never came from that. Yes, they helped. But you know where I got a lot of it from? It was when I began to read the Word of God, when I opened the source material for everything else that is out there. That is when God began to move in my life. And I'm going to say to you that those moments where God ripped my heart out and smacked me with a wet end were the moments where God took me to specific pieces of Scripture that I knew off by heart but meant nothing to me. And on that specific day, at that specific place, at that specific minute and second, God opened His Word and it changed everything about me. That is how God works. But the problem is, if I had not opened the Bible, I wouldn't have got there. None of us would have gotten there, and the book would have remained closed on the table. Let me, let me, let me put this to you in, in a bit of a modern context. How many of you bought a phone sort of recently, or, or, or two years ago? We all have. We all got phones, okay? Now, guys, in the box there, besides the phone, there was this little book about this thick. It's called a manual. You know the manual? Now, for most guys, the manual isn't really a manual. It's just a, a list of suggestions which you may or may not use. Okay? But 23 months into your 24-month contract with Vodacom, com, sorry, <laughs> uh, Vodacom, you find something on your phone that if you had realized that earlier in the two-year contract, it would have changed your life. Your phone at this point is... It's on its last legs. It's dropping more calls than the South African backline dropping balls, okay? So I'll just put that in. I said to Jacques, I may not be able to use this, this, this sermon illustration last night while they were winning, but now they're lost, I can say that sort of stuff, you see. But you come across this app, or whatever it may be, and you realize, you know what, if I'd seen this 23 months ago, it would have made my life simpler. It would have changed the way I function. I wouldn't be as stressed as I am right now. But I didn't read the book the manual, and I didn't realize what this thing was capable of. Now, many of us here will say, well, you know, I, I get the analogy. That's a, oh, it's a beautiful analogy. But you know, eventually, I do find out the solutions to my problem. You know what? You're right. In most cases, if you spend enough time with a this, with this specific struggle that you're going through, you will find a solution for it. But you may find it 10 years too late. Had you read the scriptures, had you gone back to the Word of God, had you read the manual that came with your life, you would have solved this problem a lot earlier in your life. And you would have been a happier person. Your life would have been very, very different. You would have been able to live a more fuller life. Why? Not because I gave you a book and you didn't read it. Because God gave you a book, a text message, and you sat down and you read it. And you applied it. Now, you can come from the Catholic Church. You can come from the Protestant Church. Seventh-day Adventist. You can come from the Church of Lusty Fulfillment. The Church of people with more cash than they know what to do about. You laugh. Those churches exist. Um... You can come from any of the mainline denominations. But there is one thing that remains true for each and every person who says they believe in the Lord Jesus. Your worldview, your life, your idea of morality, the way you live your life, your idea of wrong and right, the thing that makes you, guilty, feels, makes you feel guilty, your understanding of the law, your understanding of relationships, marriage, money, spawn, have all been impacted by this book. Whether you admit it or not, by this text message, everything you do has been affected. Do you know that our entire legal system is based on the book of Exodus? Do you know that? Do you know that in the book of Numbers, our moral code finds its feet in Exodus, Leviticus, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs? And our whole social structure is based on the Gospels? Did you know that? Here's the thing. This is true, whether you believe in Jesus or not. So whether you're an atheist or a Buddhist or whatever you want to be, the way the law works for you, as for me, a Christian, has been impacted by the Bible, the Christian Bible. And you can reject it, you can push it, you can do with it what you want for as much time as you want. You cannot deny that everything humanity does and is finds its good, not evil, finds its source within Scripture. 
<laughs> that is how this text message has impacted us and your world. And unfortunately for most, it's a message that many of us have not read. Push anybody to ask them, why did you do whatever you did? And more times out of none, they will say to you, I did it because somewhere along the line, the Bible gave me instructions around it. Whether you believe or not, if you trace back the reason for it, you will find it, the source in scriptures. Many of you come to church, <laughs> and this is, this is such a big mistake, but many of us come to church with preconceived ideas of what we believe. And I'm going to tell you something right now. You're going to be shocked by what is not in the Bible. Many of us come through the door thinking, well, that's biblical, that's scriptural, I'm sure it's in the Bible somewhere, and it's not. <laughs> Many of us will sit there doing things that we believe God looks down on us and says, dude, that rocks, you're awesome, do it again. But when we go and look at what we've just done, you do not find it in the scriptures. You know what the biggest mistake most people do scriptural-wise? It's found in 2 Imagination 7 verse 14. God helps those who help themselves. I challenge you to go and find that piece of scripture in the Bible for me. Go for it. You won't find it. And remember a couple of months back, about six months ago, we did a series, 10 things in scripture that you won't find in scripture. Remember that series we did? I gave you 10 scripture references that you thought were scripture references but weren't. That's the preconceived idea that we walk into churches with every single day. I need to say to you, here's the thing. If you're going to put on your church clothes every Sunday, you're going to bring your kids, put them into Sunday school, you're going to come, you're going to sing a couple of songs, you're going to listen to the word being spoken, um, then don't you think you owe it to yourself to read the message that started it all? Don't you think you owe it to yourself to read the book, the manual, the text from God? If you're going to put so much energy and effort into this thing you call religion, no matter what denomination you may come from, don't you think you owe it to yourself to open the book, the hand guide to your faith? And many Christians think they don't have to. They go through life thinking, I don't have to do that. I really don't have to do it. And here's the truth. Maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot this morning when I say this, but here's the truth. It isn't enough for me to stand here every Sunday morning and tell you about the Word. It's not enough. It's not, I'm a man. I'm a broken individual. I'm going to give you sometimes my spin on the scripture. It may not be right. But it may be. I believe it is because I believe God inspires a lot of the word that gets spoken here. Yeah? But sometimes I make mistakes. You want the truth? You want the truth? And you go and you get yourself one of these things. And then you put it on your coffee table so that everybody can see you're a Christian. Just sit there nicely. You know, when you open it, it goes, that new book noise, you know. Especially the Bibles, they make that, 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 that wonderful sort of cracking sound when you open it. No, you go buy yourself one of these, you go find one, I promise you there's one in your house. And you open it. And you read it. You know what? <laughs> we live in such a blessed country, we really do. We can moan and groan about what goes on out there. But we live in such a blessed country because any one of us can go into a bookshop today and we can go choose from 200 versions of the Bible. We can go choose from 200 translations, 200 languages. Man, we can walk into any shop and we can go and buy this book. We can, we, it's online. It's in app form. It's in hentai form. It's in anime form. It's in children books form. Connor knows what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> It comes in different cases, and here's the scary part. In most cases, it's free. And we still don't read it. We still don't read it. Do you know that there are some countries in the world who have declared the Bible to be more dangerous than guns? Because they know if their populace gets hold of this book, they are in danger. Do you know that there are some countries where if you smuggle this book in and they catch you, you'll never read anything again because your head will be gone? I had two friends who used to work in Saudi, Karen, Nigel's sister-in-law, and she's a good Christian. And she said they were going to go to Saudi for two years. And the Saudi uh, embassy said to them, please, whatever you do, do not try to take Christian literature in with you. And she said, screw this. 
And she didn't use that word, but this is what she, and she said. And she took her Bible, and she packed her clothes, and she put the Bible on the top of her clothes, and she closed the suitcase. They stopped her. Saudi, she said the Saudi guy just opened it, looked at it, closed it, said, thank you, you can go through. Didn't see it. And they have the strictest control over Christian literature in the world. Didn't see it. Didn't see it. Isn't that a God who's awesome? One more Bible in Saudi. Who knows? It may just be the one that changes the king. Who knows? You know? Many people in many other countries will never, ever have the opportunity to read this text. We have that freedom. And we choose not to. Now I know some of you are going to say to me, Andre, I've tried to read it, but the book is so hard and it's so difficult to understand. So you know what? I don't really get around to reading it. You know what? You say it's hard. Let me tell you what's hard. Making a decision in your 20s that will haunt you into your 30s, into your 40s. That's hard. Making a decision to raise your kids and at 17 wishing you had a rewind button so you can go back and fix some of the mistakes you did. Making a decision now in, in, your, in your 30s that will impact the rest of your life. That's hard. You know what's not hard? Taking 5 or 10 or 15 minutes a day and just beginning to read a book which by all admission I'm going to say to you right now sometimes it's very difficult to understand. But beginning to just read the word of God. That is not difficult. If you've done that all those years ago, you may not be sitting in this church this morning with some of the regrets that you have. The thing is, it's never too late, eh? Never ever is it too late for you to begin to read the Bible. And, some, you know, and, some, and I think this, this, this I think sums up the problem that most people have with the Bible. Okay? Some of you are going to say to me, Andre, I'm not sure if I believe everything in Scripture. I'm not sure I believe the walking on water, the exercising of demons, the feeding of 5,000, the raising of the dead, the resurrecting saviors, the empty tombs, the floating messiahs. I don't believe that I believe that. <laughs> Here's the thing. Let me ask you a question. Show me one publication in your house this morning that you will sit down this afternoon and before you open say, I will believe everything in it. Show me one book. Except for you magazine. That's about the most reliable of the lot. <laughs> now I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but show me one book. Ladies, guys, gentlemen, you buy the newspaper. Do you believe everything you read in the, Bible, uh, in, in the newspaper? No, you don't. Ladies, you buy Cosmo, Yuxke, Heat, Cosmo, Sari, whatever you want to call it. Those articles about losing 100 kilos in 10 minutes. Uh, what? Kim Kardashian staying married for longer than 15 minutes. Miley Cyrus swapping a wrecking ball for a nun's habit. Do you believe those things? No, you do. So why do you treat the Bible any differently? Why do you believe that you have to believe everything in the Scripture? You know that I didn't believe everything in the Bible when I first picked it up? And I'm going to promise say that most of you didn't either. But through consistent reading, I, became to, I came to realize that everything in the Bible is true. I, through reading it, realized that I can believe everything in the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is true. I didn't know that when I first started. And so I had a skeptic's heart when I went into it. Most of you will have that same skeptic's heart. But if you do not read it, you will never get rid of that skeptic's heart. You will always struggle with the idea that surely I can't believe. Because you're going to hook onto some of the miracles of Jesus, which quite frankly are fantastic. But you haven't done the research. So you will never move past this idea that, yeah, no man can do that, eh? I came to realize that Jesus, Jesus isn't some nice little Jewish boy. As most people seem to think he is sometimes. But he's the savior of mankind. How do I know that? It's because there was a story in there that most of you may have heard of. You remember when they took him and they tied him down and they beat him? And then they nailed him to a cross. You remember that story? And I realized that, and, and this was the son of God who could just call down like a massive legion of angels and wipe out everybody who was doing him harm. But he didn't it because he said, it is done, it is finished. They are saved, Father, they are worth it. So I will die for them. And even then I thought, well, this is crazy. Why would someone do that? But then I realized, God loves me. God loves me. In fact, I would say, and this may sound wrong, but I would say God loves me more than he loves Jesus. Because he sacrificed his son for me. And then I come home and I, I see this book. Whew. And I go to 
the book of Matthew, I think now's the time I should read my Bible. I really should. Hey, and I go to Matthew. Let's start at the beginning of the New Testament. Sounds like a good place to start, okay? The record of Jesus' ancestors. This is the record. Blah, blah, blah. Abraham, the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah. Judah, the father of Perez. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. I wonder when days of my life starts. You know what I mean? Instead of saying, you know what, okay, so I don't care who's the father of who, but maybe I should go down to this. The birth of Jesus the Messiah. Verse 18. That sounds interesting. And I'm fine until I get this whole thing that she was impregnated by the Virgin, by, by, the, by the Holy Spirit. I'm going, oh my Lord, not again. But I read it again. And I read it again until suddenly God comes and He says, but that's what happened. And my heart goes, yay. I'm saved because that's what happened. And it becomes truth. But it will never become truth unless we don't open this book. I'm passionate about this book. I tell you, and the church, those are the two things I love. Not above Jesus. Jesus first, God, then these two things. Okay. But this book is everything I need to see me through my day. And even I don't take enough cognizance of it at times. For the next couple of weeks, for the next couple of weeks, I want to make this easy for you. All right? I want to make this easy, easy for you. Have you got your Bibles with you? Who's got your Bibles with you today? Five. You do know that I'm going to pick on you next week, hey, if you haven't. All right, just, just thought I'd share that with you. You saw me bring two pims earlier. Well done. I love you, babe. You, you're awesome. You rock, eh? Hey? <laughs> no. There was a time in the 50s and in the 40s where you didn't go to church without your Bible. But this thing, this thing, made us lazy. The minister who stands up here and tells you, reads you the scripture, has made us lazy. So next week I want to see all your Bibles. All right. All of you must bring it with. I mean, you're not going to go, ladies, shopping without your husband's credit card. Am I right? Huh? All right. Guys, you're not going to go to war without a weapon. Because what makes us think we can come to church without the word? All right. I want you to turn to me. Psalm 19, 119, verses 97 to 105. Okay. Now, what we need to understand about the Psalms is it was written mostly by who? You know this. King David. King David was the rock star of the Old Testament, a man after God's own heart. God says this himself of King David. But David still has a huge bunch of mess-ups in his life. We remember the Bathsheba story. We remember her husband. We remember all those things. Okay. He's not the perfect man. Which gives me a lot of hope because I'm not the perfect man. And neither are you. But God still looked at him and said, you are a man after my own heart. So David sits down and says, you know what, I think I should write the book. What am I going to write? Like, let's do the Psalms. Where am I going to get my information? Oh, I know, I know, I know. He takes his apple and he goes, Google. Okay, I think that's right. Let me just copy and paste this. And bang, we have the Psalms. No, that does not work. He had seven books. Was the source material for the whole book of Psalms. Only seven. And don't ask me to list the first seven books of the Old Testament because I'm not going to do that. Okay? Because I'm going to get it wrong. But the first seven books of the Old Testament was what he had to work with. And that is where the book of Psalms comes from. At least the stuff that David wrote. Because Moses wrote same of it. There's a whole lot of authors. But David wrote most of it. Okay? And he writes this. He looks at the source material. And he writes this. Now, you remember something. At this point of David's life, the source material is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. Okay, it's ancient stuff that he's, 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 he's tapping into. Okay, and our reaction is, but and right there, most of us have a problem. I mean, how can this book be relevant when it's that old? Surely things have changed to such an extent that it's become irrelevant. And many people think that. David, you know what David says? He says, you know what? You can say what you want about the Old, the old Testament. You may think it's old time, and you may think it's, it's irrelevant, but I want to tell you something about this word, and this is what he starts off. He says, oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your word. David didn't like the word of God. He wasn't mildly fond of the word of God. He loved it. He absolutely loved the Word of God because he knew there was power in this Word. He goes on, verse 97, he says this, I meditate on it all day long. Who reads your Bible? Who, who of you read your Bibles every day? Some of us. 
well, I get it, we're busy. But somewhere along the line, we need to make a decision whether busy is all that important. And you need to make that time. I know you're tired at night. Maybe nighttime is the best place. Or I know that you're rushing. You've got to get to work in the morning. But maybe, <sighs> I don't know. Maybe you need to figure out something about this. But I'm going to ask you a question. For those of you who do read your Bibles, do you read the Bible? And then do you ever think about what you read during the day? Some of us do. Okay. That's what David was saying. I read your word. I love your law. I love everything that you have to say to me. And so therefore, Lord, I will think about it every day, all day long. I will meditate on it every single day, all day long. He goes on in verse 98. He says, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Not his enemies, the word, the commands are with him. Okay. What David was saying here is that, and this is so cool. At this point, we realize God knows how the world works. His word tells us what God values. He tells us that God knows how things work and how they don't work. And because David is a man who listens to the commands of, of Jesus, of, of God himself, he realizes how the world works. He knows what works and what doesn't work. You know how I know that? Because your commands, God, make me wise. In other words, your commands allow me to function in the world. You have put me in a better way because I understand this world. In fact, I understand it so well that I understand it better than those who wish me harm. Who of you would love to have a word given to you that gives you the ability to stand up to your greatest enemies tomorrow morning and say, I know how this works and I'm better than this. Huh? I would. <laughs> Open your Bible, it's in there, I promise you, you'll find it. I'd have to spoon feed this to you, it's in the scriptures. Look for it and you will find it. Verse 99, he goes on. I mean, he, he pulls into everybody, his enemies first. Then he pulls into his teachers. He says, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. In other words, you know what an insight is? Hmm? Insight is the ability to take unrelated things, connect them, and have a central message. Do you know one of the gifts that God gives most, well, all preachers, most preachers, most teachers, is the gift of insight? Because how on earth do I take Genesis and revelation, and take snippets out of that, connect it into a central message that makes sense. They're thousands of years apart. Insight. The ability to take unconnected things and find a message within that, that other people will miss. That, that in essence, is insight, okay? David, uh, David says, I have more insight with all these unrelated things that are happening around me than all the teachers, those who you sent, Lord, to teach me how to do things. I better understand the world than they do. Why? Because he goes back again to what this is. I think about your laws. I meditate on your statutes. Do we meditate every day on God's word? No, we don't. We're too busy. Our biggest problem is we are too busy. He's not even done yet. <laughs> he carries on. He says, I have more understanding than the elders. You know what he's saying here? He considers himself wiser than those who are older than him. He considers himself wiser than those who've walked a longer road than him. And it's not in his own strength that he considers this. He considers this because, again, he has filled his mind with the words of God. Not man. You can read as many seven effective habits of dead people, or what do you want to call that book? I don't know. You can read as many of these, what they call these guys, uh, <laughs> corporates love hiring them to make you feel good about yourself, um, and, you know, uh, motivational speakers. You can get as many of those guys to come and tell you what you want to hear, and I promise you something, they will talk to you, they will give you the best possible solution to your problems. Two weeks later, you'll forget what they said. It doesn't mean diddly squat. <laughs> read the word, and the word speaks to you. And for some other reason, you carry the truth with you. It may disappear for a while, but it will always come back. It will always reveal itself to you at the time that it needs to. And so I'm not a big fan of motivational speakers. I, I think they have a role to play, but they mustn't think that they're the Messiah. And I think most of them, unfortunately, tend to think they are the Messiah because they have this amazing message and everyone must just fall down and listen to what they have to say. So I'm not a big fan of them. If you're a motivational speaker, I apologize, but that's just my feelings about it. Um, I've had no success with them, I must be honest with you. Um, anyhow. Verse 100, 
Verse 100. For I obey. Let's just go back there. I have more understanding than the elders. Why does he have more understanding than the elders? Because I obey your precepts. I obey your precepts. Now let me tell you something. And this is where we mess up. We listen to God. God tells us do this. Where's our go-to place for most of us? Lord, explain to me why. Why would you want me to do that? Instead, as David said, right, God, you said it, I will do it. I obey what you've asked me to do. As people, we're like teenagers. Somebody tells us to do something, we want to know what's going on because we don't understand why they are telling us to do it. We watched a movie called, what's it called? On, on Sunday? Oh, on Monday, Tuesday? Um, do you believe or... Oh, do you believe, I think it's called. In there, the minister in this movie s- just said something so very, very deeply, uh, so, so profound and stuck with me. He says, people, Christians today, are like children who sit underneath a tapestry frame. And all we see is the back of the tapestry. And it looks a mess. You've got strings hanging and your colors flowing in. It's a grot I mean, it's, you, you can't make head or tail. Until we get up and we walk around and we look at the front. And then all of a sudden, it makes sense. God is saying, you're my children. Yes, you may sit there, and this may look like a mess to you. You may not understand what I'm asking for you. But through obedience, you will have clarity. Through obedience, we are able to get up and walk around the front of the tapestry and say, right, now I know what you were doing. Now I understand what you want from me. But our go-to place is, Lord, why? Why do you want me to do that? I don't want to do it. But you must tell me why. Give me a good reason why I need to do it, because then I'll do it. 101. David goes on. He says, I have taken, uh, sorry, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I may obey your word. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I may obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. And this is the money shot of this message this morning. David is saying, I read your word. And you know what? When I read your word, God, and I understand it, it is as if you are teaching me yourself. Who have you went to varsity? Most of you. Some of you? Great. Did you go through your whole varsity career without books? No. So why do we think we can go through life without a book? Hey? I have not departed from your laws. I have not departed from what I've learned from you because you yourself have taught me. It is God Himself. And, and, and you know what? I'll tell you something. Anybody who's read the Bible and has spent a lot of time reading the Bible, you get this. You get this because there are times when you open Scripture and all of a sudden it just makes so much sense. It's as if God reaches out from those pages and reveals to your heart the meaning behind what He has said. That's happened to me and it's happened to many of you. I'm I'm, I'm almost sure of it. But the problem is, (laughs) and this is where we mess up, we spend so much time instead of giving Him time to tell us stuff. We spend so much time asking God for the things we want instead of just being quiet and allowing Him to speak. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. (laughs) And this is so important. What if the Bible is the primary method through which God wants to speak to you today? What if the Bible is the primary method through which he wants to talk to you today? Will he get through to you? If it remains like this? Or will he get through to you if that happens to it? I love this book. I really do. David says, I get this. I get this. When he's in God's word, it is almost as if God is teaching him personally. And a lot of people miss out on that because they haven't answered the text message. They haven't opened the text message. Verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. 
sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Let me ask you a question. You're struggling with something. You're battling, whatever it may be. And you open your Bible. And all of a sudden, this answer jumps out at you. And it, it, it doesn't solve the problems, but it gives you the road to a solution. What happens to you inside? There's peace. There's a sense of peace that overwhelms you. How sweet are your words to my taste? The reverse, of course, that is true. If you're doing something wrong and you open the Bible and the Bible clearly says you should stop it and you're guilty of it, then that sweetness goes away. There's a bitter taste in your mouth because you know that what you are doing is not right. But when you get it right and you allow God to speak into your life, then you say, how sweet, are, like David did, how sweet are your words to my taste? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Nothing compares to that peace you have when God finally decides to talk to you through the word. Nothing. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care where you stay, whatever the case may be. Nothing will ever, ever, ever compare to that overwhelming sense of peace. I remember Matthew 7. Was it Matthew 7? Yeah, Matthew 6. Sorry, Matthew 6. This whole do not worry thing. God looks after the birds. You remember that piece of scripture we spoke about? It? That is my all-time, all-time favorite because that was the one thing that guided me back onto a path. When I realized that all the nonsense I was going through, that if God could take care of some little mossy out there, and how much more does he care, then how much more does he care for me when he takes care of a little feathery bird out there that means nothing? And that has guided my path for a very long time. How sweet is Matthew 6 to me, to my taste. How sweeter than the honey of my mouth. I gain understanding. God talks to us. I gain understanding from your precepts, from your laws, from what you want me to learn. Therefore, I hate every path. But the problem is we get stuck here. Because yes, we hate the path, but it doesn't prevent us from still doing them. And hence, grace comes into the picture. But that's a whole different uh, sermon series. David goes on and he finishes off with this. We know this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I revert back to the King James because I think those words are just the most beautiful words uh, in, in the style of writing. Thy word, in other words, God, your word, your Bible, this thing that you gave me to read is a lamp. And I don't see a switch on it, so I don't know how that's going to help. But there is a switch. <laughs> it looks something like this. Okay. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. When I open this thing, it illuminates everything. It lights up the area to my feet. It shows me where I should walk and how I should walk and what I should do when I walk. It's a light unto my path. Not only does it throw a light here where I'm walking, but it throws a light over there where I'm going to be walking. And that's in essence what David says. At the end of the day, because I read your word, because I apply the word and I open the Bible, Lord, I have a light, a lamp for my feet right now so that I don't have to misstep. But not only that, Lord, you think about tomorrow, so you've given me light for there. So that I know where I'm going, where I'm walking. And I think, at the end of the day, this has just become a song. It's not scripture anymore. Because many of us will look at our lives today and say, things are bad, eh? Things are really, really rough right now. And if they're rough, and according to this, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, then God is either not God, or he's unaware of my circumstances. Now, first of all, two things are wrong there. First of all, God is God in the story. And he is intimately, intimately aware of your circumstances. David gets this. David gets this. Remember, he messed up with Bathsheba. Badly. Not only did he have carnal knowledge of something.